stated that this psalm, Psalm 23, is probably the most familiar portion of Scripture in our Bible. Uh, they, said, they have said that this psalm has been reproduced millions, if not billions, of times. On signs, on plaques, on bookmarks, used at funerals, used at weddings, used in houses, used in churches, used in school settings, used uh, in businesses. This particular psalm is a very, very, very well-known psalm. But sometimes those things that we know best or we think we know best, there are still some hidden truths for us to uncover. And tonight as we look at Psalm 23, I want to direct our attention to a hopefully a particularly helpful set of truths inside of this psalm. That maybe, just maybe, that, that next time you come across this psalm, whether it be in your own personal time with God, as you read the Bible every day, amen, as you spend time with God every single day, you come across Psalm 23, maybe your mind will come back to some of these truths. Maybe you'll be driving down the road, and I've seen this by the side of the road or even partially on a billboard before. Perhaps you'll be walking in Hobby Lobby, and at Hobby Lobby, you'll find Psalm 23 on a picture or on a frame or something like that. And maybe your mind will come back to some of these truths inside of Psalm 23. The psalm that many of you, old and young alike, can most likely quote from beginning to end with relatively accurate remembering. But isn't it funny when you are put on the spot, like if I were to walk around with a microphone tonight in your face and say, quote Psalm 23 for all of us, how much you might stumble at that moment. Right now you're like, oh, I remember, but I put that mic in your face, you'll be like, the Lord, the Lord is really good. Amen. <laughs> and I'm so glad for him and everything he does. Amen. And all God's people said amen. And sometimes those things that are familiar hold some of the most powerful truths, but they're least appreciated because of the familiar nature of them. So tonight, as we look at Psalm 23, may our hearts be open, our minds be open, will not click out, and our minds go 100 miles an hour. We're supposed to, at some time between now and Christmas, get a thunderstorm. It was coming at 3, it was coming at 4, maybe coming during the message. We may lose power, but we'll continue on until I'm done. Not so many amens at that point. I think the Lord has some truth for us tonight and some help for us. So look in your Bibles, please, in Psalm 23, and let's read. And we'll, let's read this together tonight. Quote it together if you know it, and uh, if you know it well enough, but read it, quote it. Let's say it together, Psalm 23, beginning verse number 1. Would you say it with me, please? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on this time tonight, if you would please. Lord, thank you for the moments that we have, or the opportunity we have to gather as a church. Lord, this church was your idea, not our idea. And this scripture was your word. Lord, it's not our truth or our idea, but this is your word. And Lord, I pray that tonight you would touch us. Lord, I pray tonight you'd help us in this familiar psalm, this familiar portion of Scripture, Lord, that you would touch us maybe in a different way tonight, in a way that will encourage us, Lord, challenge us. Lord, I ask that as we look at this and study this portion of Scripture, that in a new way, we'd fall in love with you all over again. You're such a great God, and Lord, as we sang tonight during the song service, we heard all about your goodness, and you take our burdens, and you provided salvation, and what the cross meant in so many different ways and avenues. And Lord, I pray that tonight that we would be behind your cross and we would be under your cross and we would hear from you tonight. Lord, touch us, help us, and change us tonight. Lord, we'll give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. I ask and pray. Amen. Psalm 23. I'm going to present to you kind of the idea for tonight for the message and then we'll break it down after that. I think it'll make sense once we begin where I'm going. And uh, I think, I believe with God's grace that his truth will be helpful to us. And I think maybe a little different 
little different take tonight. I want you to look at the first verse. Very first verse, verse number one of Psalm 23. The one that even in the moment, you could get this verse. You may stumble around the middle verses in the moment of a mic in your face, but this verse you would get. The verse begins, the psalm begins, the Lord is my, what? Shepherd. Many messages on the shepherd from Psalm 23. How a shepherd watches over the sheep and the shepherd cares for the sheep and, and messages about how, how sheep are dumb and, and comparing to the fact that we are often just as foolish as, as foolish sheep. And those are accurate, right? We're dumb. We're dumb. We are. We make foolish mistakes and, and we're messy sometimes and things are ugly. Not because that's our intent or because we're just on our own path, but because at times we, we are, have the flesh inside of us still. And we have that struggle. And I'm so thankful that the Lord is our shepherd. But it's the next phrase of the psalm, and the first verse that I want to really lock in at first. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not or lack or need. Tonight I want to direct your attention to this thought. The sufficiency of our God. The Lord as our shepherd is all we need. All that he is, is all I need. When we have nothing left but God, we become keenly aware that all we need is God. When we cling onto everything else in life and try to add God to the mix of our life in the foolishness, in the deceitfulness, we will mistakenly believe that God is not enough. And at that point, we will be in want or lack or need. You see, the Lord is my shepherd. Therefore, because of that compelling truth, I shall not want. Tonight, I want to challenge you, challenge myself, challenge all of us, on this concept, is God all you need? Not all you claim to need, not all you say you need, but is he truly all that I, all that you need? Not in the theological sense like, is God enough? The answer is yes. Absolutely yes. But in the practical sense, do we really live our life as though God is all we need. And if not, then the invitation is clear and simple. Come back to the shepherd who provides everything that you need. We could stop there. We could have an invitation. But I still have a few minutes left on the clock. And we still have a few verses to go through. The following verses in the psalm will begin to provide for us some framework for the different capacities and the different places that God provides sufficient, sufficient answers to our needs. We'll go through the psalm in this way and we'll look at all the different ways that God brings all right, the sufficiency to meet our needs. Closing with that simple question, is God all that you need? As we go through it tonight though, I decided to bring some object lessons. Because you'll listen better, one, if I tell a story I shouldn't, or two, if I bring something to display up here. So I'm going to need some help up here tonight, and I've already pre-selected uh, a volunteer or a mandate. And so Brother Austin Calling, you get to come and help me tonight. Brother Austin, Dee on deputation, they're seldom here. I know he's looking forward to being with his wife in church, and so she can look at you from down there up here, and she still thinks you're handsome. That's so adorable. Now, Austin, I was debating where to put you, and... I hate to say, I'm going to put you down front. And I like you to just sit in the step. And you're going to be there for a while, man. Okay? That, that's your spot, man. That's your spot. This is Austin. He's a Christian. All right? Now, this is a hard spot. It's why I grabbed Austin tonight, all right? Because this is the hard spot to be because now he has to remain interested in the entire sermon. Looking at me when I preach and not like looking at the audience because then they'll make faces at him. It is a difficult spot right here. Whether I put him up here or here or here. So thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure we'll take you on for support as long as you stay with Dee Dee because we like her. Okay. 
But tonight I want you to think and want you to put yourself in Austin's place. As we look at the psalm and break down through the verses at what God brings, I'll bring some different objects to Austin. I want you to challenge yourself in your life and say, listen, am I Austin? Who with me so far? So let's look at the psalm, let's take a part of the psalm, and let's see what God has for us tonight. The Bible says, Psalm 23, verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The first provision we find is found in verse number 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Tonight, I'm going to present to you, first of all, that in God's sufficiency, in God's provision as a great shepherd, number one, he provides his rest. He provides his rest. Now, they tell me that in order for a sheep to actually find rest, four things must be true. Because sheep are timid, a rabbit is capable of spooking sheep and, and actually making a, a rabbit can actually make a whole herd of sheep to go off the deep end in life. And so there must be some security for rest. But also, I am told, and I'm not a shepherd, but I am told as I read about sheep, that, that where the flock lay down, it must be a place free from friction. Or if there's anything that, that will scrape their skin or irritate their leg, they won't remain restful. They also must be free from pests. If there's a flea or a fly, they won't lay, uh, lay down. And if they, they are hungry at all, they need to be full. If they're hungry at all, they will not rest. And so when, when God provides rest, he provides rest free from these other things that can distract us. So I brought tonight... Don't tell my wife. It's a pillow from the house. It's a decorative pillow. Honey, I promise it'll get back home. This week, next week, this year. A pillow tonight signifying the rest that God brings. The fact is, in our life, there are times the trouble comes so much that it's hard to find rest. While you're active during the day, you kind of push the problem down. You kind of mask it with activity. But then you lay your head down at night, and in the darkness of the night, in the, in the room on your bed, sleep is far from you. Many of you, if not all of you, know what I'm talking about. Your heart's so burdened, so heavy. Your mind is racing a thousand miles an hour. The unanswered questions, what if and why, when, all these things. And, and it's impossible to find rest. And yet, when we understand that God is our shepherd, we can in him find rest. What we do is we try to find it a lot of other ways. We try to mask it. We try to look for another way to find the rest, make ourselves tired, count sheep, whatever it may be to, to cover this thing. And we begin, if we're not careful, to not look to God for his sufficiency, for his rest. But we begin to look to ourselves for our rest. We say, listen, if I can just get, if I can just get to vacation, then I'll have the rest I need. That will bring the rest I need, just this time off work. If I can just uh, take this, this particular medication, I can find the rest. If I can just remove myself from the problem, I can find the rest. All of those answers pointing to ourselves as our sufficiency instead of the great shepherd who says, I am your shepherd, therefore you shall have no need to want, lack, or desire. Austin, if you want to lie down with a pillow, you're welcome to. You don't have to, but you're welcome to. This is also why I got Austin. He's about the only one in here who would lie down, and if he starts to snore, I will kick him. Don't push me. <laughs> Rest. Tonight, as you contemplate this psalm, I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I seeking my own rest, or am I seeking for the rest that's found in God, the shepherd? I've been there, you've been there, those times that the, the questions are just pummeling our mind, and there's no good answer. I would submit that in our life, we seldom can find his rest because we don't allow him to give us his rest. For him to give us rest, he 
provides answers to our aggravations, to our spiritual hunger, to the point of friction in our life and the fear. So number one tonight, God brings rest. You with me so far? Do you find rest in God as a shepherd? Number two, we find this also in verse number two. Where the Bible says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Not only does God bring rest in our life, but God brings refreshment. How do you refresh yourself? If you're really burdened down, if you're really having a problem, how do you refresh yourself? Do you find yourself going to the great shepherd, looking for his still water? Remember, Jesus said, if you drink from my water, the water that I give, you'll never thirst again. But if you drink from the water from this well, to the Samaritan woman, you'll be, you'll be thirsty in just a few moments. Yet in our life, we often look for refreshment from friends, companions. Sometimes we, we, we place it on social media, looking for that, that kind of affirmation in social media. In fact, there are whole uh, forums out there, at people asking other people for advice, unsafe people. What should I do? It amazes me. I'll jump on this sometimes just to see what people are working through. And it's nuts. They're asking for marriage advice from complete and total strangers and looking for a consensus on what they should do. Should I stay with my husband or my wife? And there could be who knows who behind the keyboard, who knows where, giving marriage advice. I, I see that they've asked questions about kids. What should I do to my, my teenager? I'm sorry, I don't want someone halfway around the world in a different time zone telling me about Johnny. I want wisdom from God. I want his sufficiency. They ask about job. We, we, we look for refreshment, and yet God says, listen, I'm the shepherd. I will lead you beside the still waters. I'll bring you the refreshment that you need in your life. And my friends, if you've ever been in a particularly hard time and you found refreshment, not in a companion, but in the Word of God, I tell you, I can promise you, I've experienced it, and many of you have as well. It is a different type of refreshment. It is something that just fills you from the inside out. It is why Psalm 34 is my favorite psalm. In a particularly hard time of my life, that psalm became my refreshment. Not just nice people, and I'm glad for good friends, but his refreshment. Austin, if you want to take a sip of water, you may. It's awkward, isn't it? You see, when, when you take refreshment like this, it looks different than everyone else. Does it not? There are people around us trying to look for refreshment. All right, trying to be led beside still waters. They think it's one vacation home away. They think it's one pay raise away. They think it's one relationship away. Yet God says, I'm your shepherd. You'll have no need to want. I'll bring you rest. And I'll bring you refreshment. Let's continue in the psalm, if we could, please. Verse number three. He restores my soul. I love this part of the psalm. When God brings and he provides healing. I'm told that a cast down sheep, one that is on its back, cannot right itself. Apparently, if you go sheep tipping, it's a very dangerous endeavor. Not for you, but for the sheep. And that it will bleat out for help in a frightened frustration. And if a shepherd does not arrive on the scene in time, in a reasonably short time, the sheep will die if it's on his back. Now, some of you may Google this later on and be like, this is what I found. I have no idea. I did not test this theory. And if I had sheep, I wouldn't test the theory. I don't want you to test it in my house either if I had sheep. I don't have sheep, and honey, I don't want sheep. But this is why it's so essential for a shepherd to look over his flock constantly. 
to notice when one is in a place that they need to be helped and healed and put back on their feet. And as the God of the universe, his eye is always on us. His attention is never distracted. He never misses anything. I can be here. I can be halfway around the world. God still knows me. In fact, the Bible says he knows me and you so well that he knows how many hairs are on our head. That's what kind of care he's watching over us with, looking and seeing, and knows the healing that we need. He restores our soul. This is the kid of champions. Young child scrapes her knee. This right here. This in a mother's loving touch can solve all life's problems. And yet God, my Heavenly Father, watches over me. He restores. He brings healing to my heart. You see, you know what we do with hurt? We often compress it and shove it down. Try to heal it ourselves. We try to heal it ourselves by ignoring it. By expressing it. By dealing with a different way. But, but God says, as your shepherd, I will restore your soul. I'll bring the help that you need. I'll bring the healing that you need. I'm your shepherd. You will have no need or lack in your life. When my soul is heavy, God wants to heal it. When my soul is hurting, God wants to heal it. When I've made mistakes and the foolishness of my choices have made an ugly mess of my life, God can restore my soul. It's not just a matter of time and I'll get over it. It's not just repressing my feelings. It's the fact that God is a great shepherd says that I want to restore your soul tonight. He brings rest. He provides refreshment. He brings healing. But look at me in verse number three. He restoreth my soul, but he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, this particular concept, I wasn't quite sure how to illustrate the point is this, that, that the Lord provides direction in our life. I was going to bring a map, but I didn't have time to go to the Smithsonian. I would have used a phone, but then you would have been distracted on what app was open on the phone. All right, so rather than all that, I thought, what better way to illustrate direction than a flashlight? Because I have lots of flashlights. And the Bible does say, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so I guess we can borrow an illustration from the word of God. Yes, it does work. I will, no, I will not shine it in your eyes tonight if I, I will not, well, Austin can if you, if you fall asleep. You know that God provides direction. You know what, what we do? What I'm guilty of, you're guilty of? Using my own logic. I can see the situation. I can figure it out. I'm a smart guy. You're a smart girl. You're a smart man. You've had life experience. I've had life experience. So, so God, I don't need your direction until I'm really, really, really lost. Kind of like when we're out driving. We're not lost. We're just taking the scenic route. That's 400 miles out of the way. And that'll be such a wonderful route for the kids and for the family. Rather than admit men that we're wrong, we're lost. Now listen, I know where I'm at driving. I am directionally challenged. I use a GPS on the phone. And it tells me where to go. All right, and those of you who hate me for it, sorry. But in my life, I'm also directionally challenged. My flesh doesn't know the right direction. Does yours? Yes or no? Does your flesh know the right direction? Yet how often do we rely on it? How often is our first instinct our natural reaction just to think of an answer, a solution, rather than letting God lead us and direct us and show us his path, rather than letting his sufficiency answer our need, we allow ourselves to be our own sufficiency. And we wonder, 
why at times in our life it seems like we're lost. The fact is, we are. We are. In the relationship, we're lost. In the, the job situation, we're lost. And God says, wait, I'm your shepherd. I'll bring you the direction you need. It'll be all you need. Just lean on me. If any man lack wisdom, Google it. If any man lack wisdom, phone a friend. Or maybe it says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which give it to all men. Now you have a flashlight, Austin. Don't blind yourself. He provides rest. Hold the pillow, Austin. He provides refreshment. This is why I got this guy. <laughs> if you choke on me, so help me. I will be all you need. He provides healing. There you got the healing. Yeah, I can make that work. And he provides direction. Look at verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God provides protection in our life. He's the one that puts a hedge around us that holds back the forces of evil. Everything in life, either God has permitted or God has directed. Nothing happens apart from one of those two answers. There are times that God permits things in his, in his knowledge, in his wisdom, that we don't understand. Think of Job. And Job was afflicted by the devil himself. And God permitted it. He allowed it. There are times in life that, that sinful choices will be made and they'll, they'll affect us. And we wonder, why, why, does this, why did God allow this hurt? I can't answer all of those questions, and neither can you. But I do know this, that God either has permitted it and allowed it, or he has directed it. I do know that he wants to use all of it to make us look like his son, Jesus Christ. He provides protection. This verse provides a unique illustration. Now, this is my favorite one tonight. All right, I'm just going to tell you right now. I brought a stick with me. And I get to hit Austin with the stick. Or maybe I'll get Dee Dee involved in this one. Yeah, Dee Dee, boy, you'd have bruises then. Yeah, you say, please, no. Now, I'm not going to. For all those online, I'm not going to hit Austin. <laughs> I know. You're like, wow, worst sermon ever, Pastor. Thanks. <laughs> Hit Austin. We're not taking a vote. It's not democracy tonight. Okay. But if I were to hit Austin with this stick and just rear back, like, wham, just hit him, I could leave some bruises, could I not? He would not sit around very long for me to wail on him, would he? Right? At some point, he's getting up and moving. Yes or no? Ah, some don't believe me. You believe me. Yeah, he believes me. All right, at some point, he, because this stick would hurt when I wield it in a manner such as beating Austin. In our life, the thing that can hurt us the most, according to the, the Bible, is death. Yet the Bible says that Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 has removed the sting of death. So tonight, Austin, I'm not going to hit you with this stick. I need the flashlight, though. I'm going to hit you with the shadow of my stick. See, can you see the shadow on him? I'm going to hit you in the face. I mean, I go all day long. I mean, I'm hitting him with the shadow. You feel that? No, you don't. You'll feel this. <laughs> you feel the light. You can't see. <laughs> I could go all day long. You see the shadow on his chest? You see it? I could hit him all day with the shadow. What's going to happen? It's just going to be really weird. Really weird. Yet that's what the verse says, does it not? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. Because of the sufficiency of our, of our shepherd, even death, there is no sting. 
It is merely a shadow. And God says, as your shepherd, no matter what you walk through in life, it can't touch you. I'm your shepherd. It's merely a reflection. You will be okay. This is a sufficiency found in Psalm chapter 23. So Austin, there's a stick. Don't swing it around. Don't hurt yourself. Just a little more will be done tonight. Two more I want you to notice. Verse number five. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. This is an interesting one for me and for many people because in our life we often struggle with insecurity. Am I in the right place? Did God do right by me? Did God allow life to be okay? Did he allow the circumstances of life to, to be okay? And did God make me the right way, the situations? As we think about this psalm, it's a psalm of David, we must remember that David was anointed with oil early on in life and then had significant struggles and significant calamity, including the king, the local king by the name of Saul, attempting to take his life multiple times by a couple of javelin throws and by hunting him down with all the resources uh, given to him in the kingdom. And so David here says, listen, is something wrong with me? Is something wrong in life because I didn't choose to do this? I didn't choose to be here. I didn't choose to be in, in this situation. And there's insecurity that hits us, that strikes us, as we second guess and question everything that happens. God, why did you make me this way? Why am I not taller or shorter? Or why am I not smarter? Why did you let me be in this particular family and not that family? God, why am I here in Bridgeport or not? And why am I over here? God, why, why, why the insecurity of life and the shepherd, the great shepherd says in this psalm, listen, whatever happens, I know that you've prepared that table before me. It's your plan. You anointed my head. It's your direction. And I find the security and the confirmation of God's approval. So tonight, I have a label. The label says God's approval. And my friends, when the great shepherd is our sufficiency, we can proudly wear this label. That is who approves what I'm doing. And that brings a confirmation unknown in any other way. When this person over here is not happy, God's happy. I have his approval. When no one else understands, when the whole nation is up against, when the odds are, are crazy, I have God's approval. There are teenage girls in here who wonder, well, God, why'd you make me this way? You, my friend, have God's approval. There are men in here. In the job you're in, you're like, why am, I, why am I doing this? Why can't I have that skill set and have that job and make this amount of money? You, my friend, is under the great shepherd, have God's approval. There are moms in here, ladies in here, who struggle with insecurity. We all have insecurity in our life. All of us do. That's why when it comes to testimony time, we get nervous. Right, teens? Right, Abigail? We get nervous at testimony. Right, Lydia? It's nervous testimony time. It's insecurity. What will people think? What will they say? What will they do? That's insecurity. But the great shepherd in Psalm 23 reminds us that God gives us his approval. And when he gives us his approval, we have all we need. Sure, it'd be nice to have everyone else's approval at times too. I'll be honest. Listen, I remember going through the pandemic as a pastor. I just, I just became pastor a few months earlier, I realized really quick in the pandemic, no matter what, I decided that someone was not going to be happy. And not just one, it was multiple people. And if you remember, can you remember the pandemic? Anyone else remember the pandemic? Okay, yeah, okay, like me. I mean, masks, no masks. I mean, everyone had an opinion, saved or unsaved. Everyone had an opinion about church, whether they went here or not. People from other states were calling me. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Man, 
I mean, everyone has an opinion. And they do in your life as well, do they not? I mean, church, I've told you about this before, but, but people weigh in on, on the singles here. Well, why are you single? You like that little girl, you like young girl over there? You're like, no, no, leave me alone. All right, and they weigh on marriages. I remember when Dream and I got married, and, and then they're like, hey, when are you having a kid? All right, so we had a kid. When are you having another kid? We had another kid. When are you having another kid? We had three kids. When are you going to stop? I can't make this up. I can't make this up. I'm telling you. People want to weigh in on every part of your life, don't they? They have the best answers for you and the best things for your life. They know how you ought to run their, their life's a mess, but they know how your life shouldn't be a mess. And this is huge. God as a shepherd is sufficient. And I love the fact that I can wear his label on me. I have God's approval. And I don't need your approval. And you don't need my approval. But you and I desperately want and need his approval. And when we have his approval, we have all that we need. One more. We'll be done tonight. He provides rest. Q. Austin. Thank you. He provides refreshment. You okay there? He provides healing, direction, protection, confirmation. And one more tonight. One more. He provides safety. Look in the last verse. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a great end of the psalm. That when everything else is done, I will be in the Lord's house forever. And there are moments in this life where life stinks. But I'll be in God's house with him forever. There are times in this life that, that I want to change the circumstances. But I get to be in God's house, help me, forever. And not only that, he says, surely, goodness and mercy. You see, life doesn't always seem good, but when I have the right view of God, I realize that what is supporting me in life is his goodness and his mercy. And that is all I need. So one last illustration. The key. This is not the key to God's house. That would be faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. But, but for a moment, picture here that this is the key to God's house. That this were the key to heaven. That if you had this key, you could go to heaven. This would be a very valuable key. Would it not be? If this were the only key to heaven. And whoever, whoever had it could go dwell with God in his house. Stay in his living room. Right? Eat in his dining room and be with God day in and day out. And this was the only key. What would you do for the one key to heaven? The answer is anything that you possibly could. There are some that would try to steal, kill, raise money. The fact is, God and his sovereignty and God and his power and his might says, you can have the safety with me. And you can have it, 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 and I can have it, and even Austin can have it. You see, Psalm 23 says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When you have nothing left but God, you become keenly aware that God is enough. And when you begin to comprehend and realize that God is enough, you'll begin to understand that God is more than enough.
There's nothing stingy about our shepherd. He gives generously to all who come to him. He's able to give above that we could ask or even think. Simple faith invites his help. Simple trust brings us into his home and provides unending abundance. Third night, my friend, simple question. Are you finding what you need in God? Perhaps one of these verses touched something in your heart. God is enough. God is more than enough. But anytime we try to add God to what we have, he will not be enough. He does not play well with others. The Bible says God is a jealous God. He wants not just a part of your life and a part of your heart, but all of your heart and all of your life. He will not be content just to have a Sunday in your life. He will not be content just to have the rest given but not the direction given. Or the security given but not the protection given. God is enough. He's more than enough. He is only enough. And he must be the only thing we run to. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Lord.